the University of Poznan in Poland. Uh, his research interests include many uh, very important uh, subjects in higher education, like other production, states, markets, academic entrepreneurialism, and states, studying global transformation and so on. And we, I, 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 I have been with you, but I think it's not necessary, but because you, 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 you are very well known here in Slovenia, I think I will confess to you, you did a very nice talk yesterday. The rector of the university, uh, Ivan Svetli, is in the house to share some thoughts. And uh, uh, Peter Scott accepted the kind invitation of uh, Pavel to act as a discussion in, in this session. Thank you for accepting, Peter Scott. Uh, it was not on the plan, but uh, I'm sure you were uh, a great, great, great class. And well, uh, no more words to, 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 to give you from my part. Is the time of the curing. Okay. Um, so I think it's important, and I apologize to people who were in the session previously and uh, listened to my cynicism there, but uh, I guess to give you some context, um, the Canadian, this is sort of my perspective on um, these issues marketization, privatization fiscal restraint in the future. Um, the Canadian higher education system is governed by each of the individual provinces, so we don't have a national department. Uh, and as I explained in the previous session, the, the province is following badly out in all directions um, on their own. Um, so just wanted to put that out there that constitutionally our system is a responsibility for all levels of education in the provinces. Um, I want to talk about marketization in particular because it's something that I have a personal interest in and something that I've uh, written about um, in the past. Um, higher education in our country, in Canada, been variously treated as um, a mechanism for alleviating social inequalities, um, but more and more as an instrument of labor force development. And of course, related to that is this issue of marketization, something that over the past 15 years, I think we have had an increasing uh, interest in and that is really the adoption of a more market-oriented ideological outlook on education, particularly tertiary and higher education. Um, and of course, that's seen in the displacement of traditional academic humanist uh, values and interests in education for citizenship um, and increasingly uh, we are influenced by and to some extent uh, governed by market mechanisms such as competition, private interest uh, and increasingly education in Canada and in other countries as well as regarded as a vehicle for securing regional, provincial, state, uh, national economic objectives, um, such as increasing economic efficiency, training more productive workers, um, and increasingly higher education is framed as a valuable commodity. Um, of course, instead of um, higher education as a venue for intellectual, academic, and personal exploration. Um, so, and you'll have to you can tell me time, because I always go over time. Um, so that I never really finish off, which is great for some of the challenges I have. Um, so, I have 15 minutes. Um, so there's an interesting, uh, interesting impacts on our system 
and how it's changing. Now, a lot of academics would argue that differentiation of institution is a normal thing and it's a good thing and sort of shifting and changing the landscape is healthy. Traditionally in Canada, we've had a binary system. Um, a community college system, which is more vocational and workforce oriented, and a university system that's separate degree granting research and the other academic tradition and so on. But I think one of the things that we've really seen as a result of marketization is sort of the blurring of the boundaries of, of tertiary education in Canada. Uh, particularly as it comes to degree granting. And I would argue that to some extent, well, what we've seen is community colleges, so traditionally vocationally oriented institutions now increasingly being given responsibility or authority to grant university degrees. Um, now to, I would argue that to some extent that's wrong out of the interest in transferring credits from college to university, you know, allowing more mobility, uh, you know, laddering through institutions. It's in part wrong out of that. But it's also sort of um, a function of two forces that I would say are very complementary to one another. One is institutional drift. Um, so institutions in the tertiary education sector wanting to be more like universities. And we've seen this with community colleges sort of transforming into universities. And in fact, it's creating a more stratified system of universities in Canada because we have the older, more established universities and these newer, former community colleges. So we're, we're seeing that institutional drift. Um, and we're also seeing what, what, what's been termed credential so increasingly, um, the vocationalization of the university to, to some extent. Now this has sort of been decried by everyone from Cardinal John Henry Newman to Forrest and Bell, sort of vocationalization, the professionalization of the university. Um, but we're seeing that, so one example would be nursing. So once in Canada and most provinces, and all provinces, um, you know, women predominantly, uh, work uh, as nurses study in sort of a hospital environment. Increasingly now we've moved to a system where um, all nurses who want to be registered nurses complete four year degrees. And in some provinces these credentials are actually in part granted by community colleges. So we're increasingly seeing this sort of vocationalization um, that's really from a marketization shift, and it's blurring the boundaries between uh, the institutions. Um, we've seen a growth in private degree granting, but it's been really questionable. Uh, results are, are very questionable. There are, there's, there are provinces that allow private degree granting, but by and large, uh, our institutions still for most of our public institutions. Um, but we see more private like uh, higher education. Public institutions behave more like private institutions in the quasi market system. Um, so, such as you know, connecting the goals of academic research with the goals of private enterprise and private industry. Um, exploiting the commercial potential of university research and intellectual property. Um, you know, public policies increasingly are devised to leverage private sector funding to bring it into the university for research purposes. Um, so these are some, I think, of the impacts that we have seen um, with respect to marketization, with respect to fiscal restraint, um, we've had uh, sort of a lot of upheaval in the manufacturing industries in Canada. The province of Ontario has lost tens of thousands of jobs in recent years uh, 
because when you are offshore, um, you know, the impact of globalization, more and more products being produced uh, either in you know, south of the U.S. border or in India, in China, and so on. So, um, we, so as a result, we have more and more people in need of retraining for service sector type jobs. Again, that also plays in nicely with the vocationalization of the university, more emphasis on engineering, the STEM disciplines, science, engineering, technology, um, business is increasingly uh, a large part of what the universities are doing. Um, economically, um, a lot of the provinces in Canada are having some difficulty balancing their books. Um, is a significant problem uh, all over the country. Uh, that is having, I would argue, perhaps rather devastating impacts on institutions of higher education, depending on which province you're looking at. Um, just recently, uh, in a province really that should be, um, you know, people would say we're doing really well, the province of Alberta, probably the more prosperous oil-rich provinces in Canada. Recently, the province of uh, the University of Alberta announced the suspension of a variety of degree programs. And you sort of ask yourself, what do these programs have in common? Classical language, um, classics, Greek, Latin, French, Italian, German, Spanish, Italian studies, Latin American studies, Middle Eastern and African studies, uh, print reading, music history, world music, Ukrainian folk, all these programs have been suspended at the university that is very rich. Of course, they're not staying distance, not in business. Um, in other provinces, like the province of Ontario, where the increasing problems of <coughs> fiscal restraint, um, there are all sorts of academic reviews going on, uh, all sorts of program reviews, all sorts of budgetary which, of course, is causing the hair to stand up on the back of the necks of many faculty members because they wonder whether or not their programs are going to be suspended and so on. Um, because, I mean, it really comes back to sort of the academic humanist question versus the more utilitarian market oriented question. What is the purpose of the university? The idea of a university. Is it a place for intellectual exploration? where you can study folklore, classics, German, etc. These are less utilitarian, less labor market oriented programs, or really is an institution for producing more productive workers for the economy. Increasingly, we are going that direction. Um, I think I'm running out of time, right? Um, so I think these are some concerns that uh, I would say many academics have. Um, and I won't belabor this too much. I have often, I'm sort of referring to a couple of papers I've written because I've often looked at this from the perspective of access for students, what the impacts are for individuals. Um, and I think, you know, when programs are eliminated, um, that's certainly does sort of constrain your ability to make decisions. Um, I know this morning um, in the, the first keynote presentation, there's a reference to the quasi market system. And that's really what we're dealing with here. It's, again, a public institution that wants to act for various reasons because of you know, the new managerialism and so on and so forth. Um, wants to act as a private sector organization. Um, and so it really comes down to the question of whether, whether a free market system like that really is set up to enable access. Um, and uh, so I just want to conclude. I know there, the other question was about the future. And uh, there was, a, I don't know if there are any punk rock fans the audience, but 
I think it was Joe Strummer who said, the legendary frontman for the time, said, the future is unwritten. We really can't tell. We know what direction we're going. There's no question about that. We're moving towards a more market-oriented system, a uh, more product-like system. Um, being a politician who's a critic, so I'm, my job of some of my academic work, and certainly, you know, when we're, I often wonder how to reconcile these things because there's always the question of bias, whether you actually believe that there is a such thing as an objectivity. I always believe that teaching is a political act. And that's what I believe. You're free to disagree, but we all have beliefs, opinions, and so on. So, so it's sort of, I'm in a unique place right now being the Social Democratic Party critic for education in my legislature, in a place where there is not much reason. Um, I wish I could say to you that my experience in politics has been very rewarding. It has in some ways. Being able to help the people that I'm working for, my constituents. But the legislature that I'm in, and legislatures across Canada, very uncivilized, and not places that value research and facts. And we're increasingly moving away from facts. As we neoliberal ideology, I believe, uh, part, it stays alive by the vacuum, uh, an absence of debate gives it oxygen. Um, so I just want to say the final thing, you know, where is the future going? Who knows? The future is unwritten. But I think it really depends on two things that are very, very crucial. Um, one is the ability of public policy to constrain market forces, to control. Um, and I, when I was a civil servant, I was thinking, well, really the public policy was really three instruments. One is goodwill, and there often isn't very much, especially when it comes to competing higher education institutions. The other one's public money, which we have often used to bribe institutions to act in certain ways, offering different programs, and so on. Um, and the other is legislation, which is really rules, regulations, and the law, which is a blunt instrument that, that I believe is really fundamentally the most powerful thing that we can use. Um, but I think that comes back to my second point, which is really the potential for public policymakers to resist, and counteract, contradict, and complement market forces. Because I don't want to end by more or less thinking that I, I am saying, there's no question about this, and I question the direction we're going in. But it's not all bad. There's some bright lights there. Um, I can't tell you what they are off the top of my head. Um, certainly there are lots of benefits to innovation, uh, research, productivity, jobs, etc. Um, you know, we all want to have economic growth wherever we are. Um, so I'm not entirely cynical. Uh, I hope this hasn't been too meandering, but I just wanted to share this one to so my own beliefs, some of my perspective, some of the evidence that I see. And uh, thank you very much. I'll be commenting more uh, than before, so it will be slightly different story with a different focus. Um, I was trying to link uh, globalization, privatization, financial crisis uh, in, in this presentation, and I, and I prepared something about parallel or maybe divergent trajectories of European welfare states and, and European higher education, public higher education. I think in those three, 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 three issues, globalization, privatization, and financial crisis, we immediately, immediately see, at, at the moment, parallel phase of, 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 of the welfare state and, and higher education. Uh, the, the what I'm going to focus on is, is lessons learned from or structural similarities in reforming European universities and reforming European welfare states in the last three decades. It's indeed a, a big story, but there are many parallels which, which can be easily easily shown. So um, the story is certainly about uh, 
continental welfare state, about reforming public sector services, about competition for, for public resources, and finally about the changing relationships between higher education and the state, or, or welfare state in particular. Um, higher education has been largely publicly funded in its traditional European forms. Its period of the largest growth coincided with the development of a also welfare state across Europe. Now, as you all can see, there is an ongoing far-reaching restructuring of, of welfare state across Europe. And the reforms of, of, of the welfare state can show us some directions of possible reforms of, of public higher education across Europe. Although the situation is different in different countries. Despite changes in the governance, management and funding of European universities that have been taking place in over the last 30 years, European policymakers seem systematically focused on further structural changes in national higher education systems. And this is exactly the same with, with welfare state systems across Europe. F further structural changes. There is an overall reformist attitude among politicians and also, and also, and also the wider public uh, reformist attitudes about both higher, public higher education universities and welfare state uh, in, 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 its, in, in its continental form. On the reading national governmental and international reports, transnational and also EU visions, we can conclude that profound transformations of higher education are still ahead of us. And suffice it to look at the modernization agenda of European universities. It, it's clearly seen that further transformations are ahead of us. So I'm discussing here uh, um, higher education and welfare state and the link between them as a severely under-researched topic. There are similar issues and questions in welfare, well, in welfare state studies, for instance, where would put post-communist welfare. And there are similar issues and, 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 and topics in higher education research, where to put, where to put post-communist universities. Is it, is it a separate class of post-communist universities and a separate class of post-communist welfare state? There are many parallel issues in both, in both uh, areas of, of, of research and both areas of policy. And from my, from my perspective, they are still under research. Um, Assuming that higher education services have traditionally been state-funded welfare state services <coughs> in post-war continental Europe, welfare state reforms debates as a background to higher education reforms debates are a significant missing link. I intend to fill this gap and explore possible links between the two large isolated policy and research areas. What I want to refer to at the moment is the feeling among politicians and, and at the level of the European Union, at the global level, that, they're, they're, that, the, that the reforms are mm, never-ending stories, that there, is, there are permanent processes of reforming universities at which lead to never-complete reform state and never-complete universities and also never-complete welfare state system. The reforms, in other words, are, are, seem to be further deeper across Europe. Uh, so, as, as um, organization studies shown two decades ago, uh, reforms tend to produce further reforms, both, both in this case, in my case, both in higher education and in, in, in world history. Despite relatively convergent global and European level arguments for reforms, there are different directions of current and projected academic structure in different national systems and with different implementation different, in, in, different, in different countries. And this is exactly the same situation with overall picture of welfare state reforms and higher education reforms across Europe and in particular national system pictures or pictures of implementation. So I'm expanding here the traditional scope of the welfare state term and instead of focusing on what some term is semantic poor, that is old, old age security or healthcare, I'm discussing one of the subfields in this case, higher education. Consequently, recent paradigmatic changes in viewing welfare state futures, I'm seeing here as inevitably linked to possibly, possibly paradigmatic changes in viewing higher education futures. Historically, the growth of two sectors was going in parallel. Education, including higher education, is viewed here as a significant component of a traditional European welfare state and the transformations to the state, and the welfare state in particular, are viewed here as powerfully affecting directly and indirectly public higher education systems in Europe. 
The two major dimensions with which I want to study briefly financial arguments and ideological arguments. As it seems, the power of the modern university in the last 200 years resulted from the power of the accompanying discourse of modernity, in which the university has a central, highlighted, specific, and carefully secured, also financially placed in European societies. And studied, I studied, I studied by numerous historians of, of higher education. Any relocation of the institution in the social, cultural, and economic architecture of European nations requires a new discourse which legitimizes and justifies it and sustains public confidence, without which, in the long run, it's hard to maintain a high level of public trust and public funding. So I'm trying to say that the struggles over future forms of the institution of the university are also perhaps, above all, the struggles over discourses which legitimizes its place. In the last decade, those struggles have intensified. And increasingly, they are point at the, transna at, at the transnational or, or global level. The whole idea of the welfare state is under negotiation. And uh, if, you, if you think in terms of, of mm, one word, it might be individual contributions. It would be co-funding and private policies in healthcare, multiple schemes and pensions, and cost sharing in higher education. There is a wide, wide on, ongoing discussion of various tax-based public services, and these are, these are the points which are raised often at, at various levels of discussion, and also at the EU level. Um, I want to make a difference between the financial pressures on reforms, ideological pressures on reforms, and changing social beliefs in reforms. The first type of pressures on public services is certainly financial. The cost of both teaching and research are escalating across Europe, as are the cost of maintaining advanced healthcare systems and pension systems in aging, Euro in aging European societies. One of the possible areas of social renegotiations is massive public subsidization of higher education. Even though their outcome is still undetermined, in many European countries the pressure to invest more private funding to higher education through fees or through business contracts has been mounting. And the second type of pressures on public services is, cl is clearly ideological. It comes mainly from global financial institutions and international organizations. They tend to disseminate the view that the public sector is less efficient than the private sector. Its maintenance costs may exceed social benefits brought by it, etc., etc., with, 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 with different attitudes to vote to, towards unconditional public social trust and unconditional public, public funding. Uh, what is important is that public perceptions of the public sector in general, just like public perceptions of the welfare states in general, may gradually influence public perceptions of European universities. So there are big parallels between public sector in general and public universities in particular. And uh, some tentative conclusion, because I'm, I'm, I'm restricted to 10 to 10 minutes, as you, as you know. First, public higher education worldwide is a much less exceptional part of the public sector than, than it used to be a few decades ago. Both in public perceptions and in organizational and institutional terms, governance and funding modes. Its exceptionality, or, or its exceptionality is disappearing, as all public sector services are being reformed. This is one conclusion. The second conclusion is that further reforms of higher education systems in Europe seem inevitable among this reformistic attitude towards all public sector, sector services. <coughs> the forces of change in Europe seem structurally similar, although they, are, they act through various national filters. And the last conclusion is uh, there is an increasing, there is increasingly competitive nature of public funding made available to different public services. The allocation of public resources among competing public services is increasingly based on the understanding of comparative and relative advantages of various options. Options means various segments of, of welfare state. Social outputs of spending in one policy area are increasingly assessed against social outputs of spending in competing policy areas. So the whole problem of where university is and what it's going to do is somehow recast in terms of, of resources made available to universities or made available to other social programs or made available to infrastructure, etc. etc. Finally, and there's the last sentence, or a few sentences, it is hard to imagine that the university would not follow transformations of all other public sector institutions and of the foundations of modern European welfare states. 
New ideas of functioning of the state indirectly, all the time, give life to new ideas of functioning of universities, which in continental Europe have traditionally <coughs> heavily in both teaching and research dependent on public funding, which is absolutely different from what's going on in the US. The dynamics of current reforms of European welfare states can be mirrored in the dynamics of current reforms of European universities. We suggest here that the better we understand the former, the better we can understand the latter. Drivers and lessons learned in one sector are useful or are potentially useful in understanding the dynamics of change in the other sector. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello again. Uh, I will try to bring you back to, to the Slovenian situation. I introduced our university shortly yesterday afternoon and maybe I can start to present this the case uh, referring to to uh, this university, which is a public and has been a public university throughout the time since its foundation. At the beginning, of course, this university was founded uh, in order to strengthen the national identity, to uh, serve this purpose uh, uh, in the first place, and uh, also to create some, something like we could call intellectual elite, uh, which would be created, which would be brought up uh, in the local circumstances, because before uh, our people went to Prague, went to Bologna, went to other universities all around. And this has been for quite some time the main purpose of the university, mainly only after the Second World War, when the regime changed, then the focus started to shift towards uh, another service of this university, it is to produce more uh, knowledge uh, that could be utilized uh, in the labor market, so to, to, to shape or to create, to shape the, the, uh, the educational programs in order to train people for, for the economy. And this trend, of course, has I would say gradually being amplified, till now perhaps. And the question is which factors were, were behind this trend. The first I would say, which was very important at that time, at the beginning, was maybe kind of ideological, uh, because the system made about after the Second World War was, uh, a, let's say, socialist, some call it communist system, whatever you want. I would it wouldn't go into this discussion. discussion. But later on, I think, we, we could uh, see that a similar factors started to influence the standards elsewhere in the world. The first one was massification of higher education. And when you get uh, half of the younger generation entering higher education, then you must ask yourself, where these people, when they finish, will go, when they finish. Because until there were few graduates coming out of university, these were quickly absorbed by the economy and public services and all around. But when you get massive uh, output of the universities, then of course there is a question uh, what universities or higher education institutions are doing, whether they really uh, give these people opportunity to be fit into the uh, environment and the economy itself. So this is, I think, a very important factor which influences the changing accent of the, the uh, main purpose of the university. The second uh, recent factor, of course, which we are all facing is the, the economic crisis and the lack of resources. <coughs> and especially uh, there's a natural, I would say, reaction of the public administration which finances all the public institutions, including the public universities, that they are tempted to, let's say, um, encourage public universities also to go to the market and to <coughs> fetch some resources there, one way or another. We, for instance, in Slovenia have never been told explicitly by any administration up to now that we should charge students fees. But there has been an implicit tendency, especially by some, maybe more right-wing uh, governments, to, 
to uh, send some, let's say, uh, implicit in information towards universities that this could be one of the solutions if you don't have enough money uh, out of the national budget. And I would like to stress one more factor which I think is uh, very important in, in uh, helps understand this uh, change in function of the university and it is uh, the well-known and largest fast shift towards knowledge uh, society and knowledge economy. Different uh, discussions have been there. Some say this is not a really scientific discussion, but I, nevertheless, I would say there has been a, a empirically verified shift towards changing share of productive factors in the economy. And knowledge has become much more important. There has been much more contribution of this factor to GDP growth than uh, ever before. And here, I think, could be the main the main catch because until this uh, uh, proportion of different productive factors was, was different, this issue has not appeared that much as nowadays because uh, when the knowledge becomes so much important in the production of all the outputs of the economy, then knowledge itself becomes a, a, a factor uh, of competition between, between uh, economic uh, producers, between enterprises, and also between economies. And here we come to the question of how to preserve in these circumstances public universities with, with their main mission and main function, because the main function of public universities has been in fact to enable free access to everybody to the university, everybody who is able to study of course, and uh, to, to enable free flow of knowledge produced at the university to be accessed every, everywhere. When you make knowledge an economic factor, factor of competition between uh, economies and between enterprises, then all these players here will start uh, dealing with knowledge in another, in another way. They will start keeping it, maybe not sharing that much as it used to be the case in, in public universities and in public university systems and so on and so forth. And here we are, perhaps, at the moment, where we are facing these, these challenges. What to, to, to do in, in the future? Shall we be able to preserve this basic function of public education, public universities, or not? Or shall we marketize it altogether? Because, of course, we can ask ourselves what are the consequences of this trend of marketization and, uh, uh, of knowledge itself and, and uh, education itself. For instance, one of the questions uh, which is quite of, often discussed here is whether this trend means that there will be less and less resources allocated to so-called basic research. Will universities be pushed towards more private research, more to, to, to the development kind of development research work for industry. And what that could mean for universities, because at the end, of course, there's no applied research without basic research. And uh, what that could mean in the long run. Uh, the other question, of course, is what that could mean for the social differentiation uh, in a society. Whether some weak, economically weak groups will be uh, put in much more difficult position. There will be no easy access or access, access at all for these groups uh, as far as uh, higher education is concerned. If, for instance, uh, uh, fees for higher education would be introduced. And uh, this is, these are very much discussed uh, questions here. Uh, of course, there could be also maybe positive effects, uh, we, we are more concerned about what could, uh, could be the negative effects, but 
maybe maybe there is a better transfer of knowledge between universities and industry and the basis and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't like to continue with this discussion. I think there are several other questions which come out of this situation which I think we are now in. And perhaps the situation is quite similar if you go from one country to another uh, country. To me, as the one, uh, as the, the uh, rector of a public university, of course, I think it will be very hot questions for the next years because uh, we can expect the continuation of, uh, of uh, the economic difficulties, and there will be, I do not expect much more money in the future, and there will be these tensions uh, from day to day which we will be facing. Thank you very much. I think it's really a bit unfair because all of, I've already had a chance to have my say this morning. Um, so let me just add a few kind of rather random comments. Um, first of all, listening to all three contributions, um, uh, although I think I agree with the kind of sentiments behind all of them, let me act as a bit of a kind of panel to have on the bottom of the I think there's a risk that we end up with too rosy a view of the university. After the traditional university, which we're now celebrating as the thing we must now defend, um, if we think of what its essential purposes were, its essential purposes were to train people for the traditional liberal professions. Particularly, of course, to work for government, to work for the civil service in public administration in various forms. Uh, but also lawyers, doctors and other traditional professions. That's a very core part of the university. Um, a second function of the university was, of course, to train school teachers, as I said this morning. Um, now, school teachers were, in a sense, often seen as the agents of national revival or creating national identity. Um, I can think of a very good example. I think we can all think of examples, but let me mention an example. Uh, France in the days of the Third Republic in the, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, there was almost a kind of war in that society. Kind of, uh, I mean, the time of uh, Dreyfus, of course, it was almost a war. Um, but between, on the one hand, traditional clerical, monarchist, Bonapartist views, and then, on the other hand, Republican views. And the people who were seen as building Republican values in France, and I think today still, were actually the people teaching in school. So if you look at the kind of traditional functions of many of the people <coughs> in France, it was actually, in a sense, an ideological one. And I think we can think of examples in other countries as well. Now, of course, of course, there, was a, there were very liberal intentions behind the university as well. Um, I'm acting in a kind of exaggerated way, but I think it's important that we kind of remember that. Uh, there's always the risk that the kind of, uh, there's been a kind of decline and fall. There was once a kind of golden age when everything was right. Um, uh, and I'm sort of sceptical about that. Um, so that's one point. Not a very helpful one, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the other point is that, um, that I'd like to emphasize is the kind of um, the dynamic, dialectic maybe, between reform in higher education and reform more broadly of the, the welfare state. Um, uh, and reflecting on this, I'm struck by several things. First of all, the way that reform, modernization, the idea of modernity, these were once ideas of the left. And now they have sort of become ideas of the right um, in politics. And that's very interesting. After all, conservatively inclined parties in the past did not talk about reform. They didn't want to reform things. They thought this was a, kind of a left-wing radical agenda. Um, but now it's actually in many ways parties of the left that are seen as actually trying to defend um, uh, existing kind of status quo and, and, and traditional values, which is a kind of interesting inversion. Um, and I just work on reflecting on why that has taken place, why this idea of reform and modernization has now become a kind of a more active agenda among right wing governments than among left wing governments. Um, the second point I want to make is in relation to reform, and I think I referred to it briefly this morning, and that's simply the kind of 
acceleration of reform processes. I mean, we have so many reforms now. I mean, in, in education, in universities, in health services, in social security systems. We have reforms in everything. Every government has more and more initiatives. Um, uh, and I think this is to do with something I mentioned this morning, which is the kind of politicians um, uh, acting much more like celebrities in a way, um, and, and, and trying to develop their brands, um, and therefore having to make, a, make an impact uh, in, in terms of public uh, perceptions of their policies. But also I think it's to do with the shift of the state. Once the state in a sense was a provider, it had deep responsibilities. I mean, it actually ran things. And now, of course, the state often has retreated. The state has become a regulator. And other people, privatized industries, um, uh, private companies, now they're running the services. And the state is acting as a regulator. Uh, and I think there's something in the nature of regulators to be, become very kind of inquisitorial. I mean, that's, that's what you want regulators to be. So it's not just simply about celebrity. I think it's about about that kind of shift in the nature of the state. Um, and I think we see it in higher education. On the one hand, governments say very contradictory things to universities. They say, we want to give you more autonomy. You know, we're giving you more autonomy. Um, you can decide all these things yourself. But on the other hand, actually, they have very clear ideas about what kind of higher education outputs they want in terms of the employment of graduates, in terms of how useful research is going to be, and so on. Um, so there's a strange way in which the state of is retreated on the one hand, but actually intervened more on the other. Um, and that's a very interesting kind of phenomenon, maybe linked to the, uh, what, what I said about before. Um, and the third way in which kind of modernization reform projects, I think, have become interesting is that um, you mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, they all, uh, you know, politicians don't like facts. Well, I think that's true if you mean they don't like objective, kind of empirical investigations of the impacts of their policy. Um, but they love data. They love data. Um, in terms of management, but it's data in terms of management information systems kind of data, really. It's data in terms of benchmarking league table data, rankings and so on, which is a very different kind of data. So I think in many ways, what, what, one of the problems in, 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 in welfare states, and also in higher education systems, is there's almost too much data. Frankly, if we had a bit less data, uh, maybe we would have a bit more freedom. <laughs> uh, so those are just some kind of random, let me see if there's anything else I've got. Um, uh, Yes, the idea of the public. I mean, this is a very important idea, which also I think is in terms of very reductionist ways, meaning that the state provides the resources, that universities, hospitals, whatever, are funded out of general taxation. Um, uh, in a way, I think there's another sense of the public, and that is about the idea of the public good, that we actually operate in a society in which we have collective responsibilities towards each other, in which kind of the building of solidarities is very important. Much of this language, of course, has become discredited because a lot of this language is used by communist regimes in a kind of dishonest kind of way. Um, so I think social democratic parties particularly kind of retreat. They feel they've got to apologize for this kind of language all the time. Yet it is a kind of reality because the alternative, of course, is, is disaggregating everything into individual benefits. Everything has to be kind of completely disaggregated. Um, and you can see this in approaches to the economics of education, that once uh, one can actually think of the public benefits of education, now these receive less and less emphasis, and everything is now has to be reduced, as I say, kind of allocated out to the benefits for individuals and groups and so on. Um, so I think there's, there's two ways in which we need to kind of try and recover the, way, the sense of the public university. One, I would argue, of course, for I think public funding of higher education is extremely important. As much of it as we can secure, but we must be realistic and we have to be pragmatic about it. But the second, I think, is the kind of the idea of public purposes, that higher education is a kind of public good. Of course there are individual benefits, but there are individual benefits from all, all public goods. I mean, uh, um, uh, it's good to have a 
public transport system because it makes a community work together and gives a cohesion, but it also takes me as an individual from A to B, so I'm getting a benefit from that, and that's true as higher education as well. And I think one of the problems that we face in higher education in terms of reacting to or perhaps initiating reform projects is precisely that when we're very kind of unhappy or uneasy about articulating the idea of the public good. I think we have to articulate that much more strongly and concentrate more on that public values, more perhaps than on kind of public funding and, and public regulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we have a very interesting panel. And now it's time for the audience to, to make questions and comments. And the panelists, of course, can comment not only the answers to questions or, or comments uh, of the audience, but to, if you have some uh, uh, point to, to discuss with the other panelists, it will be comfortable. So, uh, I'd like to, to answer. Yeah, if I understood correctly, in all the presentations there was an element that there are more pressures on higher education to be relevant somehow. And in a way, now Peter Scott summarized it, if we really look carefully in which direction higher education is expected to be relevant, it sounds absolutely contradictory. Yeah, either you, yeah, you can pick whatever you like and say this is the real thing, or, or you, you eat logic size and say one direction is in the forefront, you have to look at the direction, but if you go in the details and look at the individual things, it looks contradictory. But I'm just wondering whether there is an, as a basic common element yeah, in all this contradictory thing. Maybe it doesn't matter in which direction we are relevant, but we should be relevant. Yeah, this could be one conclusion of this. So maybe the politics is just only determined by mistrust in academia. Academia is a sleeping giant who has to push, be pushed in any possible direction, just to be pushed. And then if it's pushed, it's more productive and more relevant. Yeah, I, this is my only assumption if I hunch, if I hear, yeah, to what incredible directions, yeah, we invent another evaluation system, another indicator system, another um, claim of, yeah, of relevance, another incentive system. Yeah, this is all just kick. Yeah, so we, we are a giant because, you know, the future depends on knowledge or so, what all this, yeah, the, this, uh, the ideas or knowledge society, you know, they say academia is a giant. What a sleeping giant, a lazy giant, or whatever. I don't know. You see, I want, want please help me. Is that a misunderstanding? Uh, we just have to be kicked. Unfortunately, education expenditures are often put together with the other welfare state type of expenditures. On the, on the contrary, education expenditures create the future aggregate supply and the future growth. And when, when we speak, especially in the crisis time, about the expenditures, we speak in monetary terms. And it blurs the picture. Because the cuts or increases of funding does not mean a lot. And I think that the future of the higher education funding and research funding lies in a kind of a social contract for 10 years or 20 years in a distinction and prescription of a fiscal rule about the share of the education expenditure increase within the GDP group. And it can only make a sustainable education, higher education funding in the future without any kind of political pressures or kind of the reallocation between different types of expenditures. And the other uh, important thing is how to use these funds to, to decrease the equity gap. Uh, really important economists of, of our age, like Joseph Stiglitz, proved that 
the price of inequality will grow and it will even deepen the problems of the, of the modern society. So I think that this reallocation of funding that are presently within the system is one, one side of the coin and the long-term side of the coin is to link GDP growth and education expansion. Okay. Uh, Maria Slowick, Dublin City Hi. University, it's a fascinating panel. Um, in this morning's presentation, uh, Peter Scott talked about uh, the revolution in cultures of communication. And we have a politician on the panel and director and eminent researchers. And it's the, the challenge of higher education communicating with the wider public. Um, because this is something, it seems to me, that wasn't required until recently. So now it's not enough to be delivering lectures, engaging in research, but somehow communicating. And the, so some of the challenges that are, we're facing are not just coming from neoliberal states, but also the huge revolution uh, that's impacting on many sectors of society, such as the media and the news, for example. It's another dimension of the um, pressure for change in higher education and how we might respond to it. Thank you. I would be very much inclined, inclined to think in terms of isolated sectors like higher education sector, and I would certainly be enormously inclined to keep some share of GDP for higher education. But I know the social contract with higher education, higher education and the state social contract, is one of many contracts, social contracts. Another social contract, perhaps even more important, Living, living the higher education sector is the intergenerational, intergenerational social contract between the young and the old, or the intergenerational contract about pensions and healthcare for the old. We, we are generally in aging societies, so there's a number of social contracts which are parallel to each other. I would love to have a social contract with, about higher education, but uh, so they are competing, as I would say, they are competing claimants to the public purse, and there is ongoing struggle. Which, which, which discourse is more supportive, would be more su supported by the old, by the public and by politicians. And I'm not quite sure, uh, idealistically I would love the idea, but I know there's a struggle between various types of social contracts regarding various social services, and also our services, and also infrastructure. So this is just a brief comment. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I just want to make an observation. The gentleman here is sort of respond to the context is certainly important. Right. Situated context in particular, here, one's perspective, and you know, it sort of was taken back to a three-hour uncomfortable interview that Bill Clinton and other politicians once gave in response to his relationship with a certain White House intern, where he said, it "Depends on what the meaning of is, is um, as if that word could have more more meaning." But um, to respond also to that and to something Peter said, you know, it really depends on what you mean by reform. Because words like reform can have many meanings. And for neoliberal, uh, from the neoliberal perspective, reform often means rationalization, um, reduction of funding, um, you know, again, more utilitarian uh, outlook and, and, and actions and so on. Um, but it can also mean investment and renewal and, uh, you know, access to information. But I think increasingly, you know, language is used in a way to deceive by politicians. Uh, and just a brief example, in my province, you know, we have a piece of legislation called the Access to Information Act. But it's not about giving access to information. It's about preventing access to information. This point about uh, trying to get a guaranteed uh, uh, sum of money available to higher education, which is somehow taking it outside politics. Well, I have kind of two worries about that. First of all, I think in a democracy, do we want to take things outside politics? These are major resource decisions. They're major decisions about priorities for a society. So that kind of worries me. Um, uh, but also in practical terms, I'm not sure it's possible. I mean, in a sense, in Britain we used to have a system like this. Universities were guaranteed a budget for five years. Um, 
There was a very powerful intermediary body, the government, the politicians had nothing to do with it. They just made available a global sum of money, uh, put it over there, then that was distributed. And that system broke down, and I think any system like that is always bound to break down, down for some of the reasons we've given. And the third concern I have is that if you entirely justify or largely justify higher education, investment in higher education as investment um, in kind of economic wealth, of course, you, you're inviting people to make judgments saying, well, of course we want software engineers and we want people who are going to invent new games, computer games, but I'm not sure we want too many more philosophers or kind of uh, uh, Latinists or whatever. Um, so in, in a sense, you're inviting people to distort the kind of progress in the system and maybe rather than gaining independence, actually you, you kind of gain the reverse. I mean, I think there are great risks in, in uh, accepting an entirely instrumental or a largely instrumental view of, 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 of higher education's goals. I mean, um, which is what all politicians, whether the left or the right, tend to do. I mean, that's their kind of natural instinct and see higher education investment in their term as an investment. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I like very much uh, <laughs> the, the term a sleepy giant used by Professor Feinberg. Because being on, on the uh, a chair of this quite big university, I think that I can share your perception. <laughs> there are so many people here, excellent people, excellent laboratories. They are, they are publishing excellent articles all around. But when we uh, ask how much of uh, synergy is achieved within this, uh, let's say, 4,000 people with PhDs being researchers and professors, I'm a bit uh, uh, inclined to say, well, uh, there are big results in that, and perhaps there are some other universities similar, similar to ours. This is perhaps the uh, task of the management to somehow find ways of how to really wake up this giant inside institution. But of course, there is another relation when you speak about the sleeping giant, you put it, uh, put at that point, I think, the relation between the university on one hand and the public administration on the other hand. And here, of course, we try to, now we are, we are in the face to somehow convince the public administration that there is a sleeping giant which can help the country out of the crisis and can be uh, a good driving force for the development in the future. However, there are quite a few people in public administration which they don't think this way and think that that it's the sleeping giant will fall asleep for a long time and it, there's no worse in waking it uh, in or uh, up. And this is what, what the, the current discussion is all about. Discussion is all about uh, at the moment. Uh, and this is could be linked to the other question about the, the expenditures for higher education uh, uh, as the other discussant um, uh, raised, uh, because we try to somehow put uh, an, this uh, expenditures in another perspective, saying that of course this is expenditure but should be in the term the rather uh, investment than expenditure. Investment which gives brings the result in a long run, not in a short run. Unfortunately, politicians, as you know, are running uh, four-year cycles, and this is a pretty short cycle for the effects which we are looking for. And this is one of the, the major problems. The other problem, of course, is that uh, also healthcare system would be eager to be perceived like the, the sector where investments are needed in health of people to cut uh, the cost to prolong the, the, the uh, living uh, life expectancy and things like that. So this is not so easy, easy problem to be solved, but of course the perspective you look at, uh, at the higher education here is very important. Uh, rather, is there the, the perspective of expenditures, public expenditures or investment? I think uh, I wanted to uh, respond to Ulrich, but it's in the context of the, of the interventions director. 
Um, I, I, would, I also like to pick jobs to sleep big time, but I am not sure whether I would agree with Ulrich or, and, and you and would rather say that um, the child, the uneasiness we feel is that the child could push so much from external forces, but also from interpolarial internal forces, that it has no time in its own speed to move. <laughs> I was just wondering, since everybody here has had so much um, like experience in higher education studies, um, just from your um, perspective, how much has like, higher education studies and like just conversations like this has had an impact on like real reform? Because that's what we're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> My question is related to the marketization of higher education. And it's actually regarding your presentation in Canada and North America, you mentioned and used the term community colleges. And what I think probably in Europe, at least in Hungary, we uh, forgot about the whole student body and really think about university. But higher education institutions, the top universities, the excellent ones, and, uh, and uh, even the part of the Bologna process, we try to standardize and we try to do, uh, to force small colleges who are really market oriented because of the workforce, as you mentioned, late, local government, local people, etc. So my question could be related to the reforms, you know. I do not see, at least in Hungary or some other countries, that we really understood what is market orientation and uh, how it's related to the, the market. And if it's a question for the uh, Ljubljana University, I mean, if I look at 65% students, you know, for a 2 million population, probably, you know, you could approach this kind of excellent, you know, category, or sometimes serving in the local community, etc., which means really basic level as well. Okay. Well, my perception is that uh, the university is probably to balance the, these uh, very important trends coming to universities, uh, like uh, doing research in order to change uh, business, doing research to improve societies, and also uh, teaching, training people. I think, in my impression, you know, at least, is that universities and policymakers need actually balance, try to find multiple levels of things that you can do at university. And also, that might be a clue, you know? And also, another, another important thing is, well, this is a public university, for example, this one. It's a big one. It's totally different from a private university. Then you actually have to put yourself in a different, in a different mark, you know, in a different frame, and try to do things in different ways. But it's legitimate for you to do that. So not, the problem is when you have a private university trying to copy you, for example, and, and, uh, as a big university. And then I think the beauty of this will be having different systems run into a kind of similar parallel um, ways of doing higher education in order to not to you know, waste resources and, and recognize that I cannot do all things. I have to do this way, this is my model, this is your model, and so we have to be heavy low. I think that can be helpful for, for at least approaching this very complex system of factors in that. I want to leave unanswered an, an enormously important question which posed, that is the relationship between the research community in education and, and, and the reforms which is done by politicians. It, 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 the issue has been studied for, for decades. And the overall answer is we higher education researchers, we professor, we, we don't do reforms. But we inform reforms through concepts, which is a lot indirect, long term influence. We provide informed data or ask the state to give us resources to provide informed data. But I don't know if there is any higher education researcher professor who actually did a reform, a reform in any country. We sometimes help to, to, to shape national strategies. I did a Polish national strategy for until 2020. It was never used. We spent eight months writing a strategy. It was never used. So there's a very ambiguous relationship between education research and researchers. 
and the world of politics, politicians, and reforms. And it's, it, it is a very vague array, which is so why I, I wanted to not to leave it unanswered. Yes, I mean, just to build on that, I mean, you remember the sort of argument about the British involvement in the war in Iraq, and the, fitting the data around the argument. My experience in politics and as an academic has often been, you know, the political party has an agenda, so it needs the evidence to support its agenda. If the evidence doesn't support the agenda, then I don't use that. Why would I use something that is contradictory? Um, just a point about the sort of applied focus versus the academic focus. And look, I mean, I understand you know, the history of the university. I mean, universe, universities were founded for, you know, to produce people who are experienced in the law, in the civil law, or canon law hundreds of years ago, um, to produce, you know, for monks who could produce manuscripts and so on. So there's always been a sort of utilitarian focus. But I think one of the defining points, you know, I was talking about the binary system, the college, which, you know, its purpose is vocational. It was created to serve the labor market by and large uh, versus the universities, the regulation of your daily activities. If you're a community college faculty, your activities, you know, in the course of doing your work, much more highly regulated in comparison to, say, a university faculty member. We use the term loose coupling to refer to how we organize ourselves, but you know, we're we're much more tightly coupled these days in Canada, particularly through unionization, which has been so, you know, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, you know. There has been constraints say, since the early 80s, and then we responded by unionizing contacts to push back against that. So, um, you know, we've become more tightly coupled just by virtue of necessity. Yeah. 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 I don't know whether I understood your question right. You asked about the curricular reform. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'm everything because I've seen you know, 65 to them students. And they came to Google, for example, to study at the top excellent university level research, etc., or just in a vocational school, you know. Because the capability is not good, and that's why we are competing with the students. But if you think about higher level, I can leave that. How does this go? Well, I think uh, that could be a kind of uh, criticism addressed to, the, to, to what we are doing, but I think uh, we are still striving to. Uh, serve so several purposes at the same time. How uh, effective we are, how successful we are at this uh, in this service, that could be a question of discussion. But uh, as a comprehensive university, a university which is the, the largest uh, public university in the country, of course we couldn't avoid uh, uh, that, uh, that kind of policy. But I think there could be a, let's say, a parallel um, Parallel uh, uh, activities, let's say, in, in, in terms of uh, having massive uh, education, accepting big numbers of people, but at the same time uh, providing those who are most talented special uh, additional uh, activities and courses. This is one of the ideas we are discussing right now, and we would like to get uh, specific uh, support from the, the uh, state in this, uh, in this case. For instance, in Slovenia we have a special scheme, a public scheme which uh, supports uh, most talented uh, young people to be able to enter uh, high, high schools but also universities. This money is now spent maybe not, uh, not for the purpose uh, as it is meant to, because people are getting this money into their pockets. But what we are proposing is that we should offer these people additional activities in order to be able to develop their capacities more than those who, who are on average. Otherwise, there has been a discussion about this massive acceptance of, uh, of a generation, 60% of a generation into the university. 
And I'm, I do not think that uh, this uh, is a kind of a, a false policy or a mistake. But uh, until there is enough resources given to the university to deal with these people who are a bit uh, less able, we should invest much more into their education, their activities, in order to get uh, certain standards of knowledge at the end. Of course, under the conditions of, uh, of uh, cutting budgets and cutting resources for the university, this is, of course, a, a good uh, question and a criticism that should be accepted. My name is Holger. Uh, I just uh, would like to, to say thank you for, to, to our extraordinary panelist, to your host this evening, and of course to you. Thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, many ideas are on the air, still on the air, and uh, that idea is important. Uh, and we will have uh, uh, this uh, uh, dinner conference tonight. And we can 